cities, they're our biggest problem on the climate front, but they may also have the clues to our best solutions. It all depends on how we tackle the crisis. Cities are key. That's this week on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. New York City recently became the largest city on Earth to pass a climate emergency measure, joining London, Sydney, and hundreds of other localities in 15 countries in calling for an immediate emergency mobilization to restore a safe climate. And no wonder. Cities house the majority of humanity, they contribute the lion's share of carbon to the atmosphere, and they are particularly vulnerable to climate chaos, in part because they're so unequal. What happens here in New York but also in all of the world's big coastal cities matters, and it better go beyond words on paper. So what next? Here to discuss that is CUNY professor Ashley Dawson, the author of Extreme Cities, The Peril and Promise of Urban Life in the Age of Climate Change, which is out now in paperback from Verso. Michael Johnson, co-founder of the community coalition South Bronx Unite, and Arash Koarzad, an urban planner and artist and author of the Upper Manhattan Project book. Welcome all. Glad to have you. Thank you. Let's start with the city's thesis. Really, what I just read was cribbed from your book. You say cities are the epicenter, <coughs> both as the creator and the victim of climate change. Talk about that. Right. Well, the majority of humanity now lives in cities around the planet. Cities in the global south are the fastest growing cities, and cities also produced more carbon than uh, most other forms of human settlement. Um, but because they concentrate so much infrastructure, they're also highly, highly vulnerable. Um, think, for instance, about the heat waves over the summer. Um, June and July were some of the hottest months on record, and there were massive heat waves in North America and Europe. Um, and in cities, those heat waves are experienced in an even more intense way because there's so much concrete, right? Uh, so few places that people can escape the heat. I guess I hadn't realized, and maybe people have, other people haven't, that cities and buildings are such emitters of CO2, of carbon. That's right, yeah. It takes a lot of energy to keep those buildings cool, right? So um, in New York City, uh, buildings actually contribute about 70% of the city's carbon emissions. Um, so in addition with transportation, you know, those are the major factors in cities. And we've got massive cities growing around the planet. Um, so that percentage is likely to increase, as is the vulnerability of people living in those cities. So cities also are places of a lot of entrepreneurial thinking and sort of private enterprise and big bankers who think that they can strategize and make money off change. Um, yeah. The declaration that you heard, uh, good, bad, thumbs up, thumbs down, what are your concerns? Start with you. Okay, um, declaration uh, by the city council was a product of mobilization by Extinction Rebellion and a whole series of other environmental justice movements and social movements in the city. So it's a triumph that the city council passed it, but the question is what kinds of concrete uh, policies are going to be mm. uh, passed that are going to ameliorate the conditions that are being produced in cities. And will those be about concrete or will they about be about communities? Michael? Yes. And I, I think is, I agree with Ashley that it seems to be a good path forward, but we have to make sure that there's really teeth and there is policy that's going to come out of it. There's going to be really equitable, like resilient plans around the city, not just in more economically affluent communities, but communities like mine in the South Bronx, where we're mostly, at, we're the, the most affected potentially mm. for sea level rise and any types of climate change mitigation that's not occurring in our community. So, so describe that a little bit for people that don't live in New York. What's so significant about the South Bronx? Well, we have one of the largest significant maritime industrial areas on our peninsula where there's no human access, but it's only heavy industrial facilities that line the peninsula, where there's heavy industrial like diesel truck traffic or diesel truck intensive businesses and fossil fuel power plants. So we do have the large Hunts Point Produce Market as well, which brings about 16,000 truck trips per day through our community. 
So I'm in Mott Haven in Port Morris, which shares that South Bronx Peninsula with Hunts Point. And it's, it's not, there is no mitigation plan for my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. There's one proposed through the Rebuild by Design project for Hunts Point, but it doesn't take care of the entire peninsula, which some 90,000 people live in my community. All right, so yeah. let's dig down yeah. to that for just a second before we come to you, Irish, if I may. After Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, we got this rebuild by design idea mm -hmm. coming from the city. We're going to rebuild, but we'll be very careful. Right. And there was attention paid to the fact that Hunts Point Market and the area that you're describing in the South Bronx is critical to the survival of the city economy. It's where the food comes in. It's where the food gets distributed. There's the energy plant. There's um, sanitation plants up there. It could be critical. And therefore, it was identified for a special plan called, I think, Lifelines? Correct. How, Hunts Point Lifelines, right. something like that? What was your take on that, and how would your plan... Well, I think it's on? necessary to protect vital resources, but we also have to look at how we protect people. So we're looking at how we protect industry with the big U downtown, right, with protecting Wall Street. But our community with 90,000 people, right, there's always shoulder the burden for the city's waste, or like you mentioned, fossil fuel power generation, peaker stations, and heavy diesel truck intensive businesses but we're not getting any kind of equitable access or, re or resiliency measures. So the community had to create its own waterfront plan to create resiliency. Where is the city doing that? Looking at the entire peninsula, looking at all neighborhoods that are especially like? those, pardon me? What did your plan look like? Our plan uh, created seven different access points along the peninsula that would be uh, actually uh, permeable surfaces that would absorb storm surge. We work with certain uh, institutions like MIT and Rutgers and Syracuse on looking at different ways we could be smart about New Penn, how we can be smart about mitigation measures, but also accessible recreational opportunities as well. Uh, and, and we talk about economic development. A lot of what's happening on our peninsula and the reason why a lot of it's not, there's no flood mitigation plans for that is because it was all about economic development, but it never trickled down. So we're looking at how we also can create economic opportunities with green space and mitigation and resiliency and is somewhere we can actually off offset some of the really harmful things that happen to the South Bronx with high asthma rates, what, eight times the national average, high levels of obesity and diabetes. These are health, direct health issues occurring right now because of what we're breathing every day from these thousands of diesel trucks running through our communities every day and the highways that are encircling us. So you would agree that this Green New Deal idea, whatever it plans out to, turns out to be, is a potential for interesting change. It's just a matter of how it pans out. Definitely. I think, I think you have to start with a dream and thinking outside the box and creating policy that actually directly affects change. Well, that goes and that to comes from the ground up. It doesn't come from the top down. Coming to, to mm -hmm. you and your Manhattan Project, there's a lot of data out there in the world already around climate change. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of it in your book. Mm -hmm. um, why? Why a Manhattan Project? Why lay out the way that you do? What were you trying to do different that all these international committee reports haven't done? Thank you for the question. We'll get back to the reports in a second, the, the older style of doing reports, but I think we're right to talk about a crisis of climate change, mm -hmm. but it's not only an environmental crisis, it's also a crisis of governance, right? A lot of what we've been talking about is government. We know a lot of the solutions, we know a lot of the data, we know a lot of what the impacts are, but there seems to be a massive barrier between actually empowering people to take action around, around that information and to create change in their own community, right? Rather than have it hoisted on them. There's ways for people to be involved there's ways to, 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 to um, make a statement for sure. But what the Upper Manhattan Project does, or the Upper Manhattan Top Project, which is like the Manhattan Project, but to save the world instead of destroy it, is, is meant to, to kind of turn this, this dynamic on its head and say, what if we took a ground up approach and we provided a platform for people to take action rather than say the only way you can get change is if the Green New Deal happens, right? That's the only thing that is gonna save us when we can't afford that, right? We can't afford that given what's happening in Washington and given what's happening in Albany, given what's happening in, in you know, Gracie Mansion and all of these places. So uh, the Upper Manhattan Project, it takes a lot of data that, that is, is available. And when you say available, it doesn't mean that it's, it's waiting for you in your inbox every day in a way that you can understand, right? right? It means that the data exists in the world. Um, so we still, th this is a collaboration, it's still a matter of bringing together experts, it's still a matter of bringing together subject matter experts or, or people who can facilitate 
uh, and working with communities to make sure that people know, okay, what are the impacts? And not only that, but what's the process for which you to articulate your vision for what you want your community to be? That seems to be what's missing in a lot of the, the discourse is actually connecting the dots between what people want on their block, what people want you know, in their community, what services they want, what kind of aesthetics they want, right? What, what kind of life they want for themselves and for their children. And if we can connect that with all of these big aspirations to build infrastructure projects like that are stated in the Green New Deal, then I think we can transform society. But if we only do one or the other, then it seems like we're missing uh, a significant connection. So there. how are you using this book? How is it being used in communities? There aren't tools available for people to pick up and kind of say, okay, here's where I'm at in my life. Here's, here's my level of knowledge. Here's my interest. What can I do? You have to really either give everything up and say, okay, I'm gonna do what you want me to do and I'm just a body here to help, or you have to have a really high level of you know, knowledge and, and, and take uh, many other steps. So the book is really meant for anyone who, you know, I kind of joke around and say we have to give opportunities for introverted people, right? We can't just have opportunities for people who are great and mm -hmm. in, in diverse social settings. And so this, it's, it's broken up into 11 sections of, of different plans that were generated through workshops and generated through conversations. So, so there's that connection mm -hmm. there between what people want. Uh, and there's layers of scientific data that are put over that. So you can look at any of those sections and you can say, okay, here's where I live, here's my interests, here's my level of knowledge, what can I do? And it might mean taking an independent action, that's something you can do yourself. It might mean joining a social network. It might mean getting more involved in that. It might mean you have to learn a lot, right? You might have to educate yourself about a particular subject. And that's there in the reference material. It's like one of the old trapper keepers. Like if you remember the old trapper keepers and they had the uh, conversion charts in the back. And when you were a kid, you felt like when you had that information, you could do anything, right? You said, okay, I have these tools. Let me go see what I can do. Yeah. And that's kind of what this is. It's meant to, to, to inspire that, that creativity and that activism and people to say, okay, what can I do rather than let me just make a message and hopefully they'll figure it out up there. You're making room for, for introverts. We've made room for men <laughs> to discuss this because I have to say every panel that we have had about community response to climate crisis on this show in the past has been dominated by women. And it has seemed to me that from the top, whether it's AOC to the grassroots like Elizabeth Yampierre at Uprose, this is an area where women and women's organizations are responding first and quickest to the crisis, perhaps because they see it at a, at a close-up level or their visceral sense of, wait a minute, you know, we, whether it's biological or not, have the job of raising the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, Therefore, we better get involved in making sure there's a planet for them. Hmm. To put you off your comfort zone, maybe for a minute, you know, what role do you think patriarchy is playing in these top-down decisions and technological solutions? Um, who wants to speak to that, hmm. Michael? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to go, Michael? Um, what role did that play? I think. I mean, you, I think about who led the campaign against um, uh, pollution in the South Bronx, mm -hmm. you know, Majora Carter and others. It's been a, a kind of gender I I, thing. I disagree. In I think it's a community coalition coming together because we're uh, speaking for our experience, right? It's, it's a number of really, really caring people who just live in their neighborhood and want to see a, something different happen. It's not someone who doesn't live there coming and dropping in with parachuting in to help. We there, we raising families, and we fit, we saw a problem that's been reoccurring. And at some point, you stand up and say no more. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's not really about. But you don't see a gender thing. No, I don't see. I see we have a we have strong women as well as strong men. All, all right, fail on that answer, <laughs> uh, Arash. You. <laughs> well, you know, I'll start by saying that I think there's a very strong gender component to climate change. Climate change has disproportionate impacts on certain groups, right? That's one of the the themes of social justice that you hear us talking about, and that's in the publication. So, from there, I think we can say that if you look at all these crises, if you look at Sandy, if you look at things that are happening around the world in cities around the world, not just New York City, because we have a lot of resources here, we have a lot of great personalities here who can you know represent themselves but around the world women are disproportionately affected in a lot of instances right whether it's from the the physical impact of a flood or from the aftermath of having to care for people and having to provide resources and things of that nature or displacement um, as your own family's gone through exactly exactly uh, exactly um, and and from there we know that when you become a refugee similar similar circumstances so a lot of the 
the, the dynamics that apply to women being disproportionately impacted by their refugee status apply to being a climate change refugee, right? And, and we have to start making that connection. And so from here, I think you can see that the people who are most affected are the people who should be leading. And if that's women in this case, then they should be leading in that, in the, and there should be space um, and opportunities for them to lead. And the same with children. You mentioned that there's not children, but younger people yeah. who see this as affecting their future more than, than it does other people. So we can say, okay, they're being affected by this more. And that's where this rebellion yeah. or that's where this leadership is coming from. So it does, it, you know, every, everything I think um, has uh, a race and a gender and an age dynamic that we have to be very cognizant of. And we have to say, how are we correcting for how this is disproportionately playing yeah. out in, in this issue? You, I mean, you'd write about this in the book, but your response yeah. to this part of it. Um, I think you're, you're totally right. But I guess I would add to um, gender issues. Um, capitalism and <laughs> colonialism, right? So to give you a concrete example, uh, the city of Chennai, the sixth biggest city in India, has been going through a water crisis in the summer. For, for months, people didn't have access to water. You know, the, the public pipes would provide water for an hour or two every week, right? So it was a massive crisis. And in um, pictures that the news media has produced about the crisis, the typical image you see is, you know, a woman with a water jug on her head. Right. And I think that really illustrates the kind of responsibility women have around the world for social reproduction and why they're on the front lines. Another good example is, um, uh, I live in Queens. Um, we provide over 50% of the electricity for New York City. Um, I was just at a public hearing um, about public power and the failures of Con Ed during the summer when it was really hot. There was a uh, blackout around the city. And uh, a mother came with her child to testify about what it meant for her to be living in Asthma Alley as a result of these um, fossil fuel plants that are burning the dirtiest oil because Con Ed and other big corporations want to make lots of money, right? So it's about capitalism, how it impacts women, and also about colonialism, right? Because the reason cities are often unsustainable is because they were created essentially to extract resources and they were not, you know, they, they kind of bulldozed over much more sustainable and resilient ecosystems, including marshlands. That inc that's here in New York, but also in places like Chennai. So you raise a very good point, and thank you, Wolf, for going down that, that channel with me. Uh, capitalism. Yeah. You, like I, like all of us, I think, tell two stories. We talk about the crisis. We also talk about the extraordinary community that emerges in a time of crisis. And frankly, I think those pictures of women with pots on their heads should be accompanied with the pictures of the women with the, you know, pitchfork outside the government <laughs> building or the digging up the ground to make a new, a new alternative. Yeah, yeah. We've covered some of those alternatives too. You call it disaster communism. Others have called, I've called it survival socialism. Uh, there's great stories out there, and after Sandy, we did a whole report on the cooperative development that was happening at Far Rockaway, in the Rockaways, and Occupation Sandy, and so on. When we brought those people back five years later to say, how were those initiatives faring, kind of without exception, it had changed individual lives, their engagement, but development was going on along normal patterns. Huge corporations coming in, subsidies being given to far off multinationals, low income jobs, I mean low paid jobs, displacement, all the rest. To what extent can we make the kind of change that you're all talking about, bottom up, actually effective, <laughs> um, with people at the center, not profit, within the system that we have, yeah. where every climate fix is kind of looked at as a way to make a buck? We look at it as how land has been like that, the center of all of that. And that's why I was talking to Ashley earlier about how we created a community land trust. So we could, the community could be, could own, be stakeholders or the guardian of their own public trust in our own community, where we see public land, how it's been used decades after decades to cause all kind of harm to us. So we don't, we want to be able to owners of the land. So take we, that land out of the market. The speculative market being a natural opposing force to real estate speculation and make sure it's permanently and in, per in perpetuity owned by the community to create its own solutions. And what help can government <clears throat> give you to that? Or do you have to just do it all on your own? Well, I mean, there, there's a place for, for government to help, but they can't be in control. And that's, that's a fine line. And once they become in control, then you're no longer stewarding the space yourself. You're actually just being another tenant. So we want to be the landowners, meaning the community is the landowners of the land 
and make sure that we create the green space we need, the mitigation that's necessary, and potentially creating solutions that the community has with our unique and different communities. And you look at all the multiple neighborhoods in, around New York City, there's gonna be different ideas of what they need. So we wanna start that from the ground up, right? And making sure communities control their destiny a little bit more so than you would if you were just trying to be the, another, the, another developer. Mm. Ashley, the sort of place where the buck stops kind of question, it's like, really, yeah. how far can we go with these? I, I think what we need to have is movements that mm -hmm. are outside, alongside, and also inside mm -hmm. the state in its various different scales. And I'll give you a concrete example of this. So a lot of environmental justice movements in New York and in other parts of this country are trying to set up solar co-ops, right? Um, Uprose has just established the first one in the state of New York, right? The first one, pretty amazing. And what that shows is how little renewable power we have, less than 5% renewable energy in, uh, in New York State, despite um, all the power we get from Niagara. Um, why is that? Well, it's because we have Con Ed, which has all the sunk fossil fuel assets and is sitting on control. So we really need to make government um, responsible to the people, make it possible to have support for community co-ops and get through all of the red tape and bureaucracy, but also make the major provider of power for people public, you know, um, and make you it answerable. publicly owned. Yeah, exactly. Make it answerable to the people, make it de democratic and not for profit, whereas right now it's answerable to investors, which is why it cuts power out to, you know, majority working class communities of color, uh, like it did in Brooklyn during the heat wave this summer. Could community boards be an agency for some of this kind of change? Do we have institutions at the local level that could play a role? They're advisory. They have no real teeth. So. Yeah, well, I, I think it's, it's important as you're doing to connect the desire to have money with preventing communities from doing what they want, but to also recognize it's a cause for climate change, right? It, it's what's driving the consumption of resources. It's what's driving the destruction of, of natural ecosystems. And so it's, it's a problem on multiple levels. And we have to identify that as long as we allow this to be a priority, not just in the, we can talk about the entire economy, but if, if you look at something like urban planning, it's run as if it's like any corporation or any business, right? We can't do this development unless it satisfies this profit motive. And the way that's different from any other corporation is that it's affecting all of us, right? It's, a, it's our public environment, it's our public space, it's our city. And if we think that we have the right to the city, we have to actually verify that we have some agency over what happens. And right now we don't. As Michael just said, the community board is an advisory body. If it wasn't an advisory body, it's so steeped in legalese. I challenge anybody here, right, in this whole building to, to, to read through this and say, okay, how can I actually go and work with my neighbors who might not even speak English that well to articulate what our vision is, right? But they have other skills. It's just not recognized within the system. So there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of legalese, and there's a lot of um, intentional process that I think takes away agency for people and actually obf obfuscates how they can engage with the system. And we have to peel all of that back. We have to recognize that the policies that are being put in place and topics like the Green New Deal have somewhat of a poison pill in them, which is this profit motive. Yeah. And unless the developments that they're promoting are better at getting people from their home to their job so they can be more efficient at their job, they're not really happening. You know, and that's an abstract way of saying that it's a, it's a, it's a justification that's being used for infrastructure so, is to say, okay, we need to get from here faster to here faster. And that's not always the same as what makes your quality of life better. So I think this is, this, is a, this is what my answer to your question is, is that until we start talking about quality of life, until we start talking about what makes us healthier, what makes us happier, right? What makes us more fulfilled human beings and, and, and better communities, better and stronger communities, then, you know, yes, we might delay some of the impacts of climate change until wealthy people go to other planets and then they, you know, they forget about Earth, but, but we're not answering the fundamental question, which is what's gonna make us happy, what's gonna make us fulfilled, and what's gonna make us have better communities. You said nobody could explain it in this building, but we happen to be at the City University of New York Grad Center, <laughs> where there are smart people like Ashley who probably could understand it. That's just a segue to say how important is New York mm. and the work that is done here. I think it's very important. Um, uh, you know, we're the center of capital and we're a city where we can see the irrationalities of uh, urban development driven by capitalism in the kind of clearest possible way. But we've also had experiments like Rebuild by Design that are trying to provide a kind of utopian imaginary 
within the context of capitalism. So if we look at those failures, I think they're, they're pretty relevant. But I would want to say that, um, you know, as I emphasized at the outset, we're also on a globalizing planet, and it's the people in the global south who are least responsible for uh, the climate emergency, but who really are in the front lines, as well as, you know, people kind of of the global majority in New York City who are on those front lines. And what happens when you don't have effective governance um, and you, you have capital kind of and patriarchy mm -hmm. and colonialism running roughshod over populations, you know, for a while, you know, they'll sit tight and stay oppressed, but eventually there, there's going to be a revolution. There's going to be rebellion of very, various different kinds. And as you mentioned, when you don't have access to water, you're going to grab your pitchfork and head for the governor's uh, house, you know. Um, so right. you That's know, the, the revolutionary <laughs> cities part of your project. Exactly. You know, so governance in some ways was a way to kind of, at least in, in New York in the 20th century, was a way to kind of diffuse popular movements to a certain extent. But we're now in a period where uh, there's going to be a lot of pushback just because of the crises in the environmental system, which leads to social crises. We ask the question often, what will be the story the future tells of this moment? What do you think? I think the future, if we don't treat the most uh, affected and the, 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 the communities that are left behind, how do we treat them? It's going to be the example of what we can see in, in the future as to how, what we did today. If we live in New York City and it has this great disparity between the rich and the poor and how they're treated and how they're protected, that's going to be the story that's going to be told. Michael, Arash, Ashley, thank you so much. You. Great talking with you both. There's more information about both of the books that we've discussed at our website. Check it out, lauraflanders.org. And thanks.